Mr. Cormier, I was scanning the room to find your face. This isn't unfamiliar to me. I haven't interviewed someone live and in person since March of 2020. We've added some people to the room, so it gives it a bit of a different flavor, but it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, this is a topic that has fascinated me through the pandemic, because we've heard it from policymakers, whether it's the government, whether it's central bankers, about not allowing us to return to the status quo after the great upheaval of the pandemic, to find a new way forward that is more inclusive. But also when we talk about inclusive capital, Capitalism, it's become apparent that we think of people right away. This is what makes the most sense, right? We think of people being brought along through the growth that we're creating, but then we have to think of the planet too, because if the planet stays on the course that it's on, we're gonna be in trouble in terms of even greater disparities for people depending where they are on the planet. So I wanna start there with you, Mr. Cormier, because I know you have strong views on, on climate change, what we're hearing out of COP26, what views that you have shared before in terms of uh, having an inclusive recovery, but if we don't address what's happening with the planet first, we're probably gonna be in even bigger trouble. Yeah, well, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's a real pleasure, Mr. Bonnell Gregory, to be with you. Uh, a few words in French. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Très, très content d'être avec vous. Uh, J'espère que vous passez une belle conférence. J'espère que vous allez apprécier ce panel. Uh, pour moi, c'est un privilège de pouvoir m'entretenir. A real privilege for me to be, uh, to be with all of you. And yes, Gregory, I think um, I really feel that uh, when I look at the last 20 months, 24 months, how much we have been able to collaborate, private sector, public sector, governments, communities. Um, so many people decided that we had to work together to, to fix an issue that was at the pandemic. So I feel right now that we are in the same mindset regarding uh, um, you know, climate change. Uh, when I look at the last 10 years, um, when I look at the last 40 years uh, of uh, capitalism, I really feel that more and more people are looking at our last 40 years with, uh, with yes, uh, positiveness about, um, you know, how much we diminish inequality, but at the same time, collateral damage. And more and more people want to work on these collateral damage. When we talk about the way that we can move forward in terms of you know, trying to preserve the health of the planet, get climate change under control, uh, we all know well the history of capitalism or of the world that, that's got us to this point, how we have used and how in certain circumstances we've depleted our natural resources. As we look to a greener economy, can it be a more inclusive economy of people in the sense that we know that the way that we've used the resources of the planet up to this point have harmed geographies, certain peoples to a great degree? Well, totally. I think in the uh, ESG criteria that more and more financial institution and companies are working with, are integrating in their activities. I, um, it's quite obvious that in the last 10, 20 years, we have, uh, we have invested time, energy uh, on the E, environment impact. And we still have to, uh, to work on that side because there is so much challenges in front of us. There is no planet B. I think uh, we have seen in the last few weeks uh, awareness and discussion regarding that over uh, around the world. But the S, e e G, the social impact of our decisions as business leaders regarding a diversity, prosperity, how can we share prosperity, not only by the net profit at the end of the year and we pay taxes, and we ask our governments to, to fix all these social issues. And us, we will continue to work and manage our companies. It cannot no more longer work because we, we have to understand, and we are understanding more and more, that during the, the creation of value, the process of creating value for the shareholders and companies, we don't have that as a co-op. We have to look at how can we integrate social issues during the old process of creating value. And that's a big change. 
What, what is the culture shift when I think of a financial institution, when I think of Desjardins uh, and, and financing that you'll provide, you, you need to make choices, right? About which path forward do you want to finance? Is that where uh, an institution like yours actually makes a difference that says, listen, we're gonna, we're gonna finance this going forward, we're no longer gonna finance this part of the economy going forward? Well, many example. It's sure that as a cooperative, uh, like Desjardins with more than 120 years in business, founded in 1900 to help French Canadians have access to finance, to, to savings, to, to, to literacy, to education. We always had a long-term perspective in our decisions, not only the next quarter or the short-term returns that we're, we're looking at. It's sure that we're making money, more than two billions per year, but money is a tool for us to have a huge impact in the society, in the economy. And a few examples, when we are managing uh, or we are allocating uh, some of our decisions or our capital, we decided that we will keep our call center here in Quebec and Ontario. We knew that maybe it would be cheaper uh, somewhere else around the globe. But for us, keeping these jobs here in Quebec in Canada was part of a decision regarding the social impact of our company. When we decide that we will keep as much supplier than we can, here in Canada, it's another decision that for us that was important. So these are some examples of decisions that we decided may be more expensive. We have more than 900 branches, cases, uh, real estate, uh, you know, branches uh, in, in Ontario and Quebec, 900 uh, branches. Our competitors are not even close to that. But for us, it's important to stay present in regions and stay close to communities. So that's a, a quick example of really decisions that we took that we know that are more expensive for us maybe, but on the long run are better for societies. And when we invest in companies, when we lend to companies, more and more in the last few years, we have been we have tried as much as we can to influence them. And there is, yes, some activities that we said, you know what, we pass. Actually, since 2018, 25% of all the, 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 you know, the, 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 the projects that have been uh, proposed to Desjardins, mining industry, oil and gas industry, casino industry, tobacco industry, some industries we said will pass because we don't feel that is close to where uh, we think we, we, we should head all together. And we don't feel that necessarily the management, the board of directors is totally committed or dedicated to make a change. When you pass on those investments, you recently penned an op-ed to that point, you made the point that as you put it through your ESG screen and you're deploying capital, you're investing, you're making investments, you passed on some of these oil and gas and mining projects. When we take a look at the TSX Composite Index, for example, this year, the energy sector has been far and away the best performer of the year. So you're thinking long term, but short term, you're leaving money on the table. Is that ever a hard decision to make? Well, that's, that's the point. Are you in a short-term perspective or a long-term perspective? We like to sit with the oil and gas industry and we're, we're still at the table with them. We don't feel that we have to leave the table. We don't feel that we have to disinvest because there will be someone else who will be there. So we prefer to stay at the table, try to influence them, but it's sure that they understand that in the next few years, in the next uh, decade, we want to replace these kind of investments or lending because we have contract with them by, you know, uh, renew renewables, solar, and many of these companies right now in the oil and gas industry are investing in this direction. So we feel that it's better for us to be around the table, not maybe as much as we were 15, 10, five years ago. They understand where we are heading, but at least to try to influence them, to help them, uh, the oil and gas industry, the mining industry, the agriculture industry, we don't have to leave the table because we have been always there to help them and support their transition. And at the end of the day, we are also an insurer, a life and health insurance, so group insurance plan for these employees. So it's important also to try to find solution with them. 
Well, let's talk about that, obviously, because this can pit certain regions of this country against others. When we talk about a greener path forward, we talk about not investing, some organizations even divesting in traditional fossil fuels. Alberta, namely, and Saskatchewan to a certain degree, Newfoundland and Labrador, will feel that they're being left out of this new path forward. How, how do we ensure as a country we go forward, everyone rowing in the same direction? Because we do seem to have these regional disparities when it comes to the energy file and how we should be approaching it. Well, it's a very, very good and difficult question. But at the end of the day, I look at how we manage the pandemic. Even though there were some differences between provinces in the way we attack the problem or try to solve the problems or try to install or propose some solutions, we have found a way in this country to, to manage the situation properly respectfully uh, with uh, jurisdiction, provincial jurisdiction, federal provincial jurisdiction, but we found a way to work together, to listen to the scientists, to try to see how can we uh, embrace uh, solutions that are there for everyone. For me, we should learn from that. We should try to find solutions. Yes, in some part of this country, there's this issue of oil and gas. In other part of the countries, it's the indigenous. In other part of the countries, it's uh, maybe some other social or economic issues. So we really have to, there's no reason why Canada shouldn't be a leader around the globe regarding energy. We have water, we have solar, we have windmills, we have renewables, and so, so, so we can build something that is there for everyone. And when you have this long-term perspective, at least you can give hope to everyone that we can find solutions for them on this long-term perspective. But it's a, trans a just transition that we have to build all together. Easier to say, really tough to, to manage, but I really feel that there's a before the pandemic and an after the pandemic, and we should be so convinced that we have been able to manage something in the last 20 months we should be able to manage what we have to manage in the last next decade. Right, and that idea of tough to manage when we talk about well, those a planet, so maybe if we get back to people, uh, a real thrust to say we realized during the pandemic the disparities in society, the people who were hit much harder. Some people were able to go home with a laptop and a few cell phones because they had that kind of job. They never lost their income. They actually ended up saving money because they weren't commuted and you know, all the rest. Uh, so central bankers, politicians said we need to bring everyone along for the recovery. At the same time, though, by virtue of the crisis we are facing, we cut borrowing costs down to historic lows. Uh, central banks you know, flooded the system with liquidity, all necessary to keep the financial system going so we wouldn't have a financial crisis on top of a health crisis, but real estate prices soared, uh, the stock market has soared. So if you were already in those assets, you have done quite well. I guess <laughs> to make a long rambling point short, it seems that by virtue of the pandemic, if people were feeling left out of capitalism and the fruits of capitalism beforehand, even further behind now. So as we build our way out of this, this seems to be a very tough problem to try to, to get at as well. How do we bring these people along who have missed out on home values soaring, uh, their stock portfolios soaring, because they didn't have those things? Well, I, I, it's, it, it's probably one of the first time in the last century that you have seen a, a teamwork like that regarding governments, central banks, financial institution to tr really try to work together to, to, to save as much people as we can uh, and to help them to go through uh, you know tough period of time. And uh, when I look uh, at the results right now, GDP, other results, it seems that in this country we have uh, re you know some results or, or, or an exit of the pandemic. It's not really an exit, we're still in, but at least we are probably and that I hope in the third period of this game, um, it seems that how we have decided to manage this as, as much collaboration as we can on the economic perspective point of view, I think it, it, it's quite positive. But you're right, there has been collateral damage with that. Some people in some specific industries uh, are still struggling right now. So that's why I think there's some government programs that are still there and good for them. As an example, at Desjardins, we still have relief measures that are still there for many of our members, entrepreneurs, uh, personal members. We need help still in some industries, specific industries. So at least one of, one of the, the solutions 
is that financial institutions continue to help these citizens and these members who are still struggling right now. And I think it's, it's something that is easy to do. There's less people than there were. And uh, something that we, at Desjardins, as a cooperative for us, we feel that it's in our DNA, it's in our mission to do that. The second part is to try as much as we can to continue on education, on literacy, on investing in our youth to really give them as much tool as we can uh, that they can, you know, find a job, find a career, launch a company, do as much as they can to really uh, fulfill their dream. On the housing side, um, I think it's a, it's a real issue. Uh, the rates have been as low as they've never been. Uh, so should be a, a positive aspect on the housing side, but the real estate market, because yes, of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the demand and the offer right now, we are in a, in a, a situation where uh, there's no equilibrium, it's a bit disorganized, I think there's a pressure on the prices, uh, but we have seen in the last month kind of a, uh, depend of the, the cities in this country, uh, a bit of a slowdown in the increase. So we'll see in the next few quarters how, how, where, where the puck is going. When you, I, obviously, I love talking about housing, but I did want to recycle back when you're talking about the fact of uh, <laughs> what a financial institution like Desjardins can do in terms of supporting groups that have been left out of uh, sort of the, uh, the benefits of capitalism up to this point. It would seem to be key for a financial institution is extending financing, perhaps making loans that before all this, before we had these commitments, might have been deemed a little too risky, maybe taking a little more risk. I mean, what can you do at Desjardins in terms of saying uh, this indigenous project needs money? In, in the end, the world runs on money and you need that money. You need someone to finance you, to back you in the beginning, to get you going. What, what can you provide on that front? Well, we, we launched during the pandemic uh, a good spark a fund uh, of uh, $250 million. Uh, to authorize projects for people in communities, sometimes left out, and they want to start something. So first is by, like you said, with capital, with money, with cash, how many projects can we support in different communities? So we invest $250 million until, from now on until the end of 2024 to really help young entrepreneurs, young people to, you know, try to, 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 to start a project that could be interesting for them personally or in their, their community. The second thing is that we also decided to invest $3 million to support entrepreneurs who really need $10,000 or $20,000, $10,000, for their operation, to transform their operation, to try to see if they can move the needle after the pandemic. And here, it's a donation. This is not a loan. It's really, it's not, you know, a subsidiary. It's a donation that we give to members at Desjardins, people who wants to do business with us to really help them give a boost. It should be three million investment for us. We feel it's part of what we have to do. And the third thing is, you know, education, younger one, our youth. We are really, really dedicated. We're investing $50 million per year to support our youth, donations, uh, sponsorship, mentorship, entrepreneurs or personal uh, students. Uh, so this is, you know, few examples. And it should, at the end of the day, it's probably 50, $100 million per year that, that are not in our net profit at the, end of the, at, at the end of the year. But for us, it's more important to help uh, a greener, a more inclusive recovery on the long run, communities will stay strong. I'll give you a chance now to go after your competitors if you want. So these are the things you outlined that Desjardins are doing. Is the rest of corporate Canada keeping pace? Is the rest of the financial players keeping pace? Are they making those commitments as well? Because it's gonna take more than one player, just yours, to, to affect that change going forward. Well, it's, I'm, I'm always really uh, shy or humble by what we're doing. I, trying, I, I try to manage Desjardins at, at, you know, the best that I can. Uh, and I respect our competitors are, are managing their, their companies. I know that they have a, um, an option that I don't have. They have state shareholders who are looking at them uh, with quarterly results and uh, they have a, a 
a stock market that, that, they, that they're working with. So I understand that very well. But on the long run, I feel more and more, I look at some commitment that uh, the big banks uh, have, uh, have done over the last few months regarding uh, climate change. Uh, the UN Zero uh, announced that they have made uh, with Mark Carney. Uh, so I really feel that there is more and more engagement from, from their side uh, regarding climate change. And I think it's good news. Are we, are we all going to be better in 10 years than we are right now? And now we are better than, than we were 10 years ago? I'm totally convinced of that, even Desjardins. But I really feel that as a co-op, as a financial group that has this long, long-term uh, goal in its DNA, um, it's probably maybe more easier for us because we don't necessarily have this same quarterly pressure. But I feel that there's a change in the last 12 to yeah, 12 to 20 months in Canada with the financial institution, and and, and I feel that they are they are really, really uh, serious, committed, and they want to make a change. For inclusive capitalism to work, I think you hit a good point there, that we're going to have to look past the short-termism of a publicly traded company that has to report every quarter, uh, year over year, and the bottom line needs to look better quarter over quarter. We want to see improvement. We've been mired in this thinking for so long, and it wasn't only the pandemic. Before the pandemic, so many discussions yeah. were being had about how do we move past that. We don't seem to be able to move past that. We get caught up in the moment. We get caught up on, on the performance of the day. Uh, are you hopeful, and you said you're not bound by those constraints like other companies are, but are you hopeful at some point we can move past that? What would it take for us to move past that as investors, as, as you know, as citizens? Well, I, I, I feel that we're heading in the right direction for a few reasons. First, uh, I think we're on the pathway to declare or, um, you know, uh, each quarter, each year, we will have more and more auditing regarding impact on climate diversity, inclusivity, uh, what the company is doing for the society. I'm totally convinced in Montreal right now, we will have uh, an office with the ISSB that have been announced at Co-op 26 Frankfurt in Montreal, that we will be able to, to, to work to find some KPI or some really audited reports that we will be able around the globe to follow uh, the accomplishment or what companies or, or, or managers will accomplish with their companies. So I really feel that we are in this decade, in this decade by 2030, we will have to report more strongly, officially, um, efficient, efficiently too, uh, on other results than only financial results. I'm totally convinced of that. We're doing it at Desjardins. Uh, but now so many companies are trying to do something, but there, there's no baseline. There's no science some, sometime behind. That's why we signed the business ambition 1.5 uh, deg Celsius degrees with the UN uh, initiative. Uh, so we will have targets at Desjardins that will be followed, set, followed and published each quarter uh, and uh, audited by independent people uh, with the science-based uh, approach. So I really, that's why I'm positive. There'll be more and more pressure uh, on companies and entities to really report what are you doing for the society? And I feel that yes, at Desjardins, we have been in this mindset for many, many years. And you know, even if we're not on the stock market, we have more than $45 billion uh, around the globe of people who are funding our activities. So they are looking at our, 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 our returns. They are looking at how we manage the company. They are looking at if we are good governance. So we're not, you know, on the on another right ice ring as, as a co-op, we are in the same uh, level playing field, but we're not necessarily looking at returns uh, like some of our competitors. Did you hear anything at COP26 that made you feel better about how the global financial system is starting to address these? Some of the points you're making there made me think of Mark Carney, of course, our former Bank of Canada governor, former governor of the Bank yeah. of England, now working pretty hard on this file. And he was talking about the same kind of getting past the near-termism. Uh, for all the pledges that were made at COP26 and all the speeches and pronouncements, did, did you walk away with that thinking, okay, we're headed in the right direction? Well, I really feel that it's probably one of the... Uh the gathering of the co-op that the, the co-op that that the financial sector was a i think 
as much in, involved as they ever been. Uh, I think it's uh, it, it's good news, uh, not only because how much money we're ready to invest, but I really feel that it's uh, it's clear in my mind that the financial sector is uh, more involved than ever. Uh, we understand that we have a huge role to play because we. We have so many clients, so many suppliers, so many members as Desjardins uh, who wants to do business with us and they want to continue to do business with us if we try to be a game changer. You know, we have a, a, a mutual funds at Desjardins, ETF, uh, who are investing only in companies led by females, in companies where there is no investment in oil pipelines or in pipelines free. At the end of this year, we had around $5 billion of, our, of investment from our members. At the end of June, it was 7 billion. Two billions in six months only. So the pressure from our members and clients will be so huge in the next few years that financial institution will have to, to change their mindset, to have a huge impact. And I think if there's something that I really appreciated at, at this COP, there's still a lot of work to do, is the fact that I really feel that financial institution around the globe wants to make a difference and wants to be more involved than ever. We only have a couple minutes left with each other, but I wanted to ask about the people who might be listening to our conversation, probably not in this room, but maybe in this room, who think that uh, they're skeptical. They're skeptical that financial institutions that have taken us this far in capitalism can be the ones to take us toward a more inclusive capitalism. How do we make sure that people who think that the system is rigged against them and it's going to be the same old, same old, can view you as an ally in the fight? Well, um, it's a good question. I think uh, there, I understand. I understand why maybe there's people that are skeptical uh, because many, many discussions in the last 30, 40 years, a system that has been built like, like we know now uh, with the impact that we have. But I really feel that seriously, um, the discussions are there. I feel that more and more there'll be a, a, a worldwide governance regarding uh, the kind of information that we will declare as a financial institution or any society. Uh, we will have employees, employees as an example at Desjardins, you know, 52,000 employees in this country. They're putting pressure on me. They expect me to do something. They're working for Desjardins for a purpose. So they are strong influencers. We are suppliers of some of our clients, they will ask us. So I really feel that I understand why people could be skeptical. Seriously, I understand that very well. But at the same time, what's the other option? What's the other option? At least it's to continue to work on it, maybe go faster, maybe try to be more blunt, bold call, bold decisions in what we have to accomplish. But I feel that there is a before and an after pandemic and this decade, more and more people will put pressure on leaders, on politicians, on companies, and they will vote and they will buy with this climate change in their mindset. Parting thought I want to get from you. I was just thinking about COP26 political leaders descending. Uh, do the bankers in this country need to get together on a semi-regular basis? Just discuss ESG, discuss inclusive capitalism. Well, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. We, 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 and like you said, before the pandemic, 2017, uh, I, I was listening to Louis O'Day and we had discussion. You know, in the last three, four years, there was already a discussion around the globe, North America, regarding the collateral damage of capitalism, uh, how, how financial institutions can, can do something on that. How can we change the way we look at our returns, where we invest, where we lend our money? So I really feel that, uh, you know, no one has the solution to fix all the problems we have to face. We must must continue to work together, to discuss together, to find solutions together, because it's a global issue that we're facing right now. So yes, I think as much, yes, and some people are like maybe, oh, it's discussion, it's blah, 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 and we're not heading in the direction as fast as we can. I understand that, but at the same time, we're in the middle of a, a, a huge transition, and we don't want to leave too much people, uh, you know, uh, 
around the table. We want to bring as much people at the table. I think a discussion like that with financial institutions, central banker is a good idea. Appreciate the discussion today. And one day we might even be able to do it in person. Oh yeah, I hope so. I hope so. It was a real pleasure. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. C'était très agréable de vous rencontrer. Thank you very much, Thank you.